This all right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. I'm Kim Laney, your OLLI coordinator, and today's brown bag topic is dementia and diet. This year, OLLI at HSU is celebrating 15 years of lifelong learning on the North Coast. We have a great lineup of classes this spring, and we encourage you to visit our website to learn more. Throughout this year, we will continue to celebrate our 15 years with the many classes being offered at a low $15 fee for our OLLI members. If you're not a current OLLI member, please consider joining today to help us reach our goal of 1,000 new and returning members before June 30th. Over the past year, OLLI has transitioned to offering all of our courses and discussion groups online so that our members are able to stay connected while remaining safely at home. In addition to our brown bag presentations, Another way to stay connected with Ollie at HSU is to attend the discussion group, Let's Connect with Tracy Barnes Priestley. All of our brown bag presentations are made possible by the friends of Ollie. Thank you. Please help us continue to provide these excellent free community presentations by making a donation to Ollie at HSU today. Here's the contact information for Ollie. And the best way to contact our office is via email. And quickly, before we get started, I wanted to remind you that when signing up for classes, it is helpful if you register um, early. During these busy times, there may be a delay due to the volume of people signing up for classes. And we want to make sure we get you in your class and the meeting link sent in a timely way. Thank you. Following today's presentation, we will make the recording available on our website please navigate to the brown bag presentation page and find the link to, um, to the video archive to locate past presentations that are available. Um, once again, thank you for staying connected with Ollie at HSU. We're ready to get started now. And if you haven't already muted yourself, please do so. Um, we will take questions at the end of both presentations. So hold on to your questions. Um, or you can put them in the chat and we will pick them up at the end of the um, presentations. Again, thank you for joining us today. And Jane, go ahead and introduce our, pre our presenters. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce both Caroline Connor and Heidi Collingwood. Caroline has been a family physician for over 28 years and has been a migraine specialist for most of that time. She's actively engaged in educating the public like you guys. Oh local physicians and other medical personnel about all aspects of medicine, but especially about migraines, nutrition, dementia, and immunization. She's on the executive board of the Humboldt Del Norte County Medical Society, focusing on recruitment and retention of physicians in our area, and most recently re received an award, um, which maybe you saw in the paper in the Times Standard. Heidi is, in short, an entrepreneur. For close to 40 years, she's been a small business owner of, for her own, of her own salon. With a passion for health and business, she became a sales coordinator with the Juice Plus company over 24 years ago and recently became a certified health coach with the Dr. Sears Institute. Dr. Sears, if you're not familiar with him, has written multiple books on inflammation and other related subjects. In her heart, she is First, a mom who enjoys inspiring healthy living in her own community of Humboldt County and desiring to spread that gospel globally. Lecturing, holding group, group sessions, and educating people on the four pillars of health, of lifestyle, exercise, attitude, and nutrition. She strives for all around wellness. She just completed the family's pregnancy and seniors portion of the Dr. Sears program and is now a certified health coach and a certified laughter yoga leader. So we're going to start with Caroline, Dr. Connor. Thank you. Your turn. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Especially hi to all my patients out there who I see their beautiful faces. So, um, so we are going to talk about diet and dementia. And I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Kim. And thank you very much, Jane, uh, for introducing me. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I think Jane did a pretty good job. Um, I am a family physician. I've been in this area for, it's 
going on 25 years. Um, for most of my career, I spent um, focusing on migraine and obviously family medicine. Um, and I have, I am now not seeing patients, but I am educating the public on all kinds of different topics um, and uh, working hard with the medical society to bring more doctors here. So today we're going to talk about uh, dementia and diet. Um, some disclaimers, I'm only here to share knowledge of associations, I'm not here to give anybody any medical advice, um, and all your medical advice should go through your personal physicians. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about how dementia is defined um, by the lay people and by doctors. We're going to specifically talk about uh, Alzheimer's dementia. We're going to talk about what happens on the cellular level in Alzheimer's. Uh, and then we're gonna connect that to type two diabetes mellitus. And then we're gonna discuss how um, there's a relationship between diabetes and Alzheimer's. We're gonna talk a little bit about scientific studies because a lot of that um, is important to understand when you read the literature and also to maybe understand how we got our COVID uh, vaccines uh, through scientific research. And then we're gonna uh, look at the studies that link lifestyle to improvement in dementia. So the word dementia has, is very big and become a convenient way to describe sort of a broad group of symptoms. Um, the dictionary describes it as madness or out of one's mind. And if you looked at non-English languages, specifically German, it's defined as idiocy or imbecility, mental deficiency, moronism, French derangement, um, Italian insanity and lunacy. And what, what bothers me about all of that is sort of, I basically find that that nonspecific generality can rob patients of their humanity in the eyes of others and most importantly, uh, in their own eyes. But everybody has the same terms. We go by the same terms. So we're gonna describe it the way everyone does. And um, there's multiple kinds of dementia. We're gonna specifically focus on Alzheimer's disease today. But there are some pretty interesting overlap um, between Alzheimer's and the vascular dementia that you see uh, that some people get either after strokes or if they have bad cerebrovascular disease. Um, Parkinson's disease and dementia is close to my heart. That's what my grandmother uh, got in her last years of life. Um, and then there's multiple other kinds of dementia, Lewy body dementia, et cetera. So, but we're gonna focus on Alzheimer's. It's a huge problem. Let's look at the statistics. About a third of all seniors die with Alzheimer's or other types of dementia. Over 5 million Americans today struggle with it. On a global scale, it's pretty much an epidemic. In 2010, we had about 454,000 of new cases of Alzheimer's. Uh, it is estimated by 2030, that number, number will increase by 35% uh, up to 615,000, and by 110% by the year 2050, up to over 950,000. Please note that the trouble in our brains can start 20 to 40 years prior, so we want to heed some of these warnings. And 80% of Alzheimer's patients are 75 and older, and then one in 10 are age 65 and older. So when should you be concerned? Okay, well, uh, forgetting all things, people know that, that that's sort of the, the typical form. Uh, but then people start to have trouble with languages. Uh, they're not able to find the exact words. One of the things they'll do is they'll sort of talk around it. So if you're trying to explain a watch, they'll say, well, this thing on your arm that maybe tells time. Um, people have difficulty concentrating and reasoning. They might have task. Uh, uh, problems such as paying bills or balancing a checkbook. Some get lost in familiar places and others have outright confusion. As it gets worse, uh, some people have episodes of anger or aggression. They'll start being delirious. They don't, they see things that aren't there. Um, unfortunately, as the disease progresses, they don't eat, they don't bathe, they don't dress, um, and they'll lose bladder and bowel control. This is a nice little depiction of how 
um, in the beginning, you'll have mild co cognitive impairment. It's the disease is beginning in what we call the medial temporal lobe. And those are sort of short-term memory losses. And then as it progresses, uh, disease in the lateral temporal and parietal lobes, and people will have uh, poor object recognition, as I mentioned to you just a second ago with the watch. Moderate Alzheimer's, the disease spreads to the frontal lobe and people have poor judgment and impulsivity. My grandfather, oh, may he rest in peace. He, I remember him being in the hospital and just being really inappropriate to the nurses as he was having frontal lobe dementia. And then sometimes people will lose vision as it progresses because the occipital lobe in the back of the brain is affected. So when we do MRI scans, we look for some telltale signs and here's a normal brain and the normal cerebral cortex. And um, what you see in Alzheimer's is shrinkage of this cerebral cortex and the ventricles, which have the fluid uh, filled areas of the brain start to enlarge as the tissue shrinks. So what we think is happening in Alzheimer's, and by the way, you know, this is constantly uh, changing, but we do think that beta amyloid, and when I say beta amyloid, some people only think of negative uh, deposits, uh, but beta amyloid is seen in the brain in very healthy people. But you start to see more of it, and you have loss of nerve cells, and then you get more proteins within the neuron, which I'll show you, called neurofibrillary tangles. Healthy versions of these proteins supply food to the brain. Okay, so beta amyloid and tau is there. But what happens is they become damaged and then they misfold and they literally make the neuron and the synapse sticky. And the amyloid fibrils turn rogue and morph into rope-like structures that interlock like the teeth of a zipper. Here's a depiction for you. So here is a normal nerve cell. Nothing's in it. There's connections between it. And here's an Alzheimer's uh, brain where you have neurofibrillary tangles within the cell and then amyloid plaques outside of the cell. So researchers had believed that the main cause of the cognitive deficit that characterizes Alzheimer's was aging and the loss of neurons. However, we now hypothesize that there's an imbalance in the cellular and molecular mechanisms of synaptic plasticity. And just to let you know, learning about synapses is very important just for your overall knowledge, because really that's where a lot of medicines are acting, and you'll see here, information uh, transmission is occurring through the synapse. So I just gave you a little depiction. There are two neurons. You have an axon that leads one neuron to the next, and then um, it basically lands on a dendrite, and the synapse are, is the linkage between it. So. Like I mentioned, synapse is the junction between two neurons, and that's where neurotransmitters go across, and I will show you that. Plasticity, I know that a lot of you are reading about neuroplasticity, and plasticity means it's the ability of the brain to change and adapt to new information. And for me, in my migraine world, that's really important because some people who suffer terribly from migraines, it's because we keep making more neurons that go to the pain sites of our brain, but we can actually reverse that. The brain is not static like we used to think. Synaptic plasticity is the biological process in which patterns of synaptic activity result in changes in synaptic strength. So if you get more and more information going across the synapse, that leads to learning and memory. And long-term plasticity is the dominant model for how the brain stores information. So what happens is in the synapse is you have synthesis and storage, and I'll show you that in a second, of neurotransmitters. And then they're released and they're recognized by the postsynaptic receptors. And then when these neurotransmitters are, they might be old, they need to die, they need to be degraded normally. And this folding and degradation is called proteostasis, and this really declines with aging. So here is a, a great depiction. You can see here's a, a neuron here, 
and then there's a synapse between neurons. And this is the depiction here of this synapse. And you can see that proteins, neurotransmitters, go into uh, a area called a vesicle. That vesicle gets down to the synapse at the end and then releases a protein or neurotransmitter in this case. Now this neurotransmitter is then picked up by a receptor on the receiving neuron, and then you get a response. It could be a million responses, move my arm, you know, um, create more memories, but that's how it happens. And then what happens is some parts of those neurotransmitters have to die and we need degradation enzymes to make them die. So hopefully you can follow. Here's a, just a, a neuron. This is a synapse of a healthy brain, and this is a synapse in an unhealthy brain. So in the healthy brain, you've got neurotransmitters that go into vesicles, they go across, the neurotransmitter is picked up by the receptor right here, and information goes on. But in Alzheimer's, what you see, these little red areas are the amyloid plaques, and you can see that they can gum up the synapse. And so this makes it very difficult for information then to be transmitted because if an amyloid plaque is sitting in this receptor, well, then the neurotransmitter can't get there. So let's talk about apoptosis. It's, it's literally the planned suicide of cells. Senescent cells are damaged DNA and remain in suspended animation. Okay, so senescent cells are, are cells that really need to die and we, we have processes for which they die, but sometimes they don't die well and they sit there. And these senescent cells will then secrete cytokines or inflammatory mediators, which trigger this huge immune reaction that may drive many aging related diseases. And the multiplication in the immune system leads to immune suppression and dysregulation. And I just wanted to mention right here from the beginning, we know that polyphenols, which are found in fruits and vegetables, have been shown to eliminate these senescent cells. Amyloid plaques cause the neurons to die because they trigger an immune response. You get neurofibrillary tangles, like I mentioned, that form inside of the neurons, and they interfere with the actual cellular machinery, which is used to create and recycle proteins, and that ultimately kills the cell. So this whole concept of inflammation and immune activation, you're gonna continuously read about in, because I would say that the end of the 20th century and the 21st century is all about inflammation. I like to talk about dementogens, which are, it's a coin, uh, it's coined by Dr. Dale Bredson. And um, he discusses, uh, that there are certain things which are dementogens, like an inflammatory diet, which we'll talk about, lack of exercise, because exercise increases brain-derived neurotropic factor, poor sleep, which affects our glymphatic system, which is one of the ways in which we clean out these senescent cells every night. Stress causes increasing cortisol, which actually can then cause shrinkage and dysfunction of the hippocampus. This is where our memories are, are retained. Toxins are in our environment, can cause inflammation and cause changes to our brain. And what we know with COVID, certainly lack of relationships increases stress. So all these are what we call dementogens. So functional medicine likes to talk about lifespan versus health span. Um, and we know that there are no proven ways to prevent dementia. And I'm gonna explain that to you in a second. But we think that there are some healthy things that you can do to help your brain prevent it. Certainly the first one is eat well and prevent diabetes. Physical activity is important. Social interaction is important. Sleeping seven to nine hours per night is important. Decreasing your stress, keeping toxins at a minimum, um, getting a healthy microbiome, which is the bacteria in your gut, which needs to be healthy. And even your beliefs and thoughts will increase your lifespan and health span. So in order for me to explain how there is a relationship between diabetes mellitus and dementia, we need to understand that this is what we figured out. We realized that of 
all the type two diabetes mellitus, it accounts for 67% of all Alzheimer's dementia cases. And as you know, as diabetes has gone up with increasing weight in our society, so has dementia. So what is diabetes for those of you who don't know? Well, this shows you that here is the small bowel connected to the pancreas in a healthy body. The pancreas secretes a hormone called insulin and insulin will bind to a receptor on a cell, which then allows glucose or sugar to get into the cell to be processed. If you have type one diabetes mellitus, which is a autoimmune disease, that occurs because you had a virus that attacked the pancreas, it does not produce any insulin and therefore no glucose can get into the cell. In type two diabetes mellitus, which is usually occurs um, uh, with people getting more and more overweight, you have a secretion of insulin and you can secrete all the insulin we want, but unfortunately the glucose still doesn't get into the cell because it's for failing to respond to that insulin properly. That's called insulin resistance. And this depiction shows you that in a normal healthy artery, we have glucose and we have insulin um, that is then able to get through the artery and, and into the cells, but in insulin resistance, all you have is sugar and you have uh, insulin uh, going through the bloodstream and you pee it out. And this is how we check for diabetes. We do a blood test and we see, oh my God, there's quite a bit of sugar and quite a bit of insulin in here. And you can see a lot less going into the cell. So what's the relationship between diabetes and dementia? Well, as I mentioned, type two diabetes accounts for 67% of all Alzheimer's. High blood glucose causes damages to tissues you see it in heart disease, and you certainly see it in uh, vascular uh, disease in the brain. High blood glucose causes insulin resistance, and a rise in insulin resistance causes chronic inflammation. And we call Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes mellitus. I need to bring this to your attention about medical research because I think it's important not only. And nowadays, because it's through this kind of study when which we got the uh, COVID vaccines, but to explain to you the different kinds of research so that when you read about research, you can understand and discern what is a good experiment versus not a good experiment. So there are three types of primary medical research, basic laboratory, we're basically studying animals in a lab, we're looking at different biochemistries and genomics, and then there's clinical trials. The best clinical trial is the interventional experimental trial, and I'll explain that in a second. And we also have multiple observational styles, uh, uh, trials, excuse me, where we give therapies or we look forward or we look backward and see how people did. And then there's all kinds of epidemiological studies. So types of clinical research. There's applied research, which is aimed at solving practical problems. And then there's observational, and a prospective study is looking for relationships between lifestyle factors or environmental exposures and the development of diseases. So basically, um, we're looking ahead. But then there is a lot of uh, studies in which we do retrospective studies, uh, which we rely on study subjects who've already had a disease. And then we look and compare them to someone who didn't have the condition, and we figure out, is there a difference between them? But the best type of trial that we have are, ran well, I should basically say randomized double blind controlled trials, where we basically take two different groups of people at random. One gets a therapeutic intervention. So for instance, in the COVID trial, one got a COVID uh, vaccination, the other one didn't. And then at the end, we assess the impact of that intervention. Both the person who's receiving and the person who's doing the research are blinded. They do not know which they got. So you don't get any bias. So conducting um, clinical trials on research specifically is very difficult. 
Um, it's almost impossible to conduct a traditional double blind controlled trial um, because we can't use true placebos when you're studying essential nutrients. You can't really deprive people of nutrients. Foods contain a staggering number of different biomolecules. Consumers have underlying genetic factors. And it's just a practical issue that basing a nutritional study on people's honest recollections of what they ate is very difficult. So when you look at this and you look at the literature after you leave my, my talk, you'll see there's really no randomized controlled trials, but we do have lots of information from mouse models and we have lots of information from retrospective studies that correlate markers of inflammation with diabetes and neurogenitive diseases. And we've just done a, a whole bunch of several studies uh, to, with the concept of brain food. What are the best brain foods? But conclusive evidence is still lacking and you need to understand that. As I was doing research for this, I learned about the Global Council on Brain Health, which was created in 2016 that brought together 94 experts from 23 different countries and 80 universities and organizations to reach consensus on the state of this science. The Global Council has produced a library of reports distilling evidence on how lifestyle and modifiable risk factors impact brain health. And one of the most important people involved is uh, Dr. Martha Claire Morris. She's since passed but she was professor of epidemiology at Rush in Chicago and the director of the Rush Institute for Healthy Aging and was a founding member of this global council on brain health. She wrote a book, if you're interested, called Diet of the Mind. And her research focused on studies that live up to a scientific method. Again, not a randomized controlled trial, but really good prospective and retrospective research. Of course, she concluded that green leafy vegetables, nuts, berries, beans, whole grains, fish, poultry, olive oil, all is very important uh, for brain health. Thumbs down on red meat, butter, margarine, cheese, pastries, sweets, fried or fast food. What she found is that the people who had the highest third of scores who ate well, ate this diet, had the slowest rate of decline. And her uh, investigation was called MIND, which is Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay. So this was her study, but there's been multiple other studies. McAvoy et al. Uh, studied both the Mediterranean diet with the MIND diet, and again, found higher adherence to the diet was independently associated with better cognitive score. But there's multiple studies out there. There's one on the Nordic diet, that has berries and rye, and oat, barley, and DASH diet all, everything that similarly pointed to a better diet and uh, better uh, cognitive uh, long-term health. So I just wanted to put this back in here. So just reminding you that in type two diabetes mellitus, glucose does not get into the cell very well as you have insulin resistance. So we look at different foods that have glycemic index and glycemic load. And just to give you the definitions, foods that cause a rapid rise in blood sugar, such as white bread and sodas, they have a high glycemic index. Carbs with low glycemic index are typically green leafy vegetables. Glycemic load is a way to measure the overall impact that foods have on blood sugar over time. And there are charts and there are books that describe what foods have low glycemic indexes and low glycemic loads and what foods do not. Foods with low glycemic index are complex carbs that are bound with fiber that bind with micronutrients in the gut and slowly release glucose. Whole unprocessed foods, like low glycemic carbs, like leafy greens, kale, cruciferous vegetables, like broccoli, cauliflower, and then beans, blueberries, apples, all of these have low glycemic load. So what has a high glycemic index or load? Um, all the calorie dense and nutrient sparse food like sodas, chips, donuts, white flour, cookies, candies, pastries, cereals, and anything with added uh, sugar like high fructose corn syrup 
cane sugar, agave, honey, rice syrup. And you really wanna think about industrial prepared foods. All of them are really not good for the brain. They eliminate the fiber and they throw away the micronutrients and phytochemicals. And those are typical, typically found in sugar, flour, processed cereal and fruit juices. Refined vegetable oils like soybean and sunflower oils are thought to be also promoters of inflammation. You need the high oleic sunflower oils, but you really wanna stay away from your canola oils um, and really all the oils except um, olive oil, coconut oil, um, and I'm blanking, oh, and avocado oil. Those are some of the best. I wanted to bring up the concept of nitric oxide because uh, uh, Heidi is gonna talk a little bit about it. And you find nitric oxide in all kinds of vegetables. Um, and this is not nitrous oxide, by the way, it's nitric oxide. Okay, and you'll see it in uh, vegetables, all vegetables that improve heart health. You'll get more nitric oxide in vit with vitamin C, vitamin E, all the polyphenols, which are found in all the different fruits and vegetables, especially multiple colors. And you'll get nitric oxide in exercise. And what's important about nitric oxide is it vasodilates blood vessels. You get dilation of blood vessels, sending more blood flow uh, to the brain, which is the opposite of what happens in people who get strokes, where their blood vessels are narrowed and you can get um, uh, contraction of those blood vessels. Again, healthy and unhealthy fats have a lot to do with the brain. Omega-3 fatty acids, uh, they regulate inflammation and activate healing mechanisms to the brain uh, because our brain is made up of fat. And, the, and it helps to stabilize the cell membranes. So fats from olive oil, avocado oil, palm fruit oil, coconut oil, all your nuts and seeds, and all your fatty fish. This stands for salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Um, all are very healthy oils. So you wanna avoid all the unhealthy oils like soybean and canola oils. So I just made a little chart for you. Refined carbohydrates, because it increases your glucose production. Increased glucose production can lead to diabetes. And we know that more diabetes you have, the more inflammation you're gonna have, which again, leads to Alzheimer's. You wanna have good fats. You wanna stay away from unhealthy fats that can lead to Alzheimer's. You certainly do not wanna have insulin resistance, which comes from type two diabetes mellitus. But also all kinds of chronic inflammation damage arteries and damage all of parts of our body, but specifically in the brain, which can then lead to Alzheimer's and cause shrinkage of the brain as well. Oxidative stress and free radicals damage arteries, things that will give you oxidative stress is just being outside in the world. Um, you wanna do everything you can to boost your immune system uh, to prevent you from having Alzheimer's. So, I wanted to bring this up, you know, just so that you have an idea in your head um, that inflammation itself is what is causing people to die from COVID. They're not dying from the actual virus, but they're dying from this dysregulation of the immune system and the immune response. And we get dysregulation from poor diet, poor sleep, too little exercise, too much stress, toxins in our environment, and in this case, COVID. So, you wanna make your diet colorful, okay? You wanna have the rainbow and they wanna have the rainbow because those are, uh, there's polyphenols in different colored vegetables. Um, and when you eat plants, you're eating greater than 8,000 polyphenols. So in general, you wanna eat green leafy vegetables found in kale, spinach, collards. I'm so sorry about that, my dog is barking. Uh, fatty fish, berries, uh, good tea, like green tea, and uh, just a small amount of, of coffee. And these are typical foods that we call superfoods. Your nuts, including walnuts, which is the best nut to eat, all your berries, uh, green tea, certain spices like turmeric, all your green leafy vegetables, good olive oil, good coconut oil. And so I want to leave you with this. You know, we can't change our genes, 
but we can change how they are expressed. And genes are just a recipe for making proteins and other body chemicals. Bad genes are like a loaded gun that never has to go off if you have a good lifestyle and in good environment. And so again, I wanna leave you today that your DNA is not your destiny. You know, when I was thinking about um, my grandparents, I was very worried I would you know, be at risk for Parkinson's disease and be at risk for dementia. And uh, now I really know that, it, that really I can make a difference and change things. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and let Heidi take over. Heidi, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can okay. you all see me? <laughs> Hi there. I'm Heidi Collingwood, and I want to thank Dr. Connor for welcoming me to this call today because I like to be on the side of prevention. And for, uh, to Kim and to Jane as well, thank you so much. So I'm Heidi Collingwood. I'm a certified health coach through the Dr. Sears Institute. And um, I have... A couple of daughters here locally in Eureka, one's attending HSU. She's really into fitness and health as well. So is my youngest daughter, 17. She's a soccer player. And I've always been interested in health. My grandmother, um, I'll never forget going to Florida and visiting her and her fridge was full of vitamins. And I didn't understand why people kept vitamins in the refrigerator. But in Florida, you kind of have to do that. Anyway, in my late 30s or early 40s, I experienced some inflammation in my body. And I'm a hairstylist, so it, it did partially have something to do with chemicals, but it also had a lot to do with stress. And so I decided to take my journey deeper and look more into prevention and nutrition, mindfulness, meditation, um, self-care, and the benefits of laughter yoga. So as you can see, I'm a laughter yoga leader and we're doing laughter yoga regularly, almost every day now, especially during COVID. And that's a wonderful stress buster. <laughs> so anyway, today I'm going to introduce a scientific plan through Dr. Sears about how we can feel younger and live a longer, healthier life. And I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Can everyone see this? Okay, so our prime time can be at any age, depending on our age and our health. And it can be in our 30s or 40s, it can be in our 50s or 60s. And we can still, if we keep in mind that we can be in a repair mode or prevention mode here. Um, today we'll be focusing on some tips on how to age in a healthy way by learning some uh, self-care, some, um, oh dear, <laughs> how we can have health be our hobby. We all know what an IRA is. We, we've probably all invested in an IRA and Dr. Sears believes in an IRA spelled I-R-A-H. And this is an in, in individual retirement account for your health. And um, we're going to learn how we can do this today. My talk, by the way, is going to be a lot, lot more basic than Dr. Connors. She's so scientific. <laughs> anyway, how we can make our health our hobby is by learning how our body makes its own medicine, reducing inflammation in our body, how to practice traffic light eating, partnering with your physician, and a lot of you are um, some of Dr. Connors' patients here, you'll, you'll agree with this, and um, implementing a moving plan. Did you know that your body makes its own medicine? And in 1998, um, Louis Anargo, PhD, received the Nobel Prize for discovering how our body makes its own medicine. And I'd like for you to guess where it is, where it's located. You can write it in the chat if you'd like, or you can, um, anyway, we can talk about this later too. So as you can see, it is in our endothelium. Our endothelium is the lining of our blood vessels, and they are about one cell layer thick. If you were to take them, remove them from the human body and spread them out flat, they would cover the surface of several tennis courts. 
And this is just amazing how these tiny little millions of microscopic prescription uh, bottles containing this metabolically active cell. It's your body's internal pharmacy. It is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. These tiny little prescription bottles release a chemical messenger called nitric oxide. This helps to maintain the blood vessels health and tells the arteries to our organs and tissues to function in a healthy way. This is truly the body's fountain of youth. As you can see here on the left, this gentleman's endothelia is open. Blood is flowing and you see the nitric oxide being released from the tiny little prescription bottles. And this is what a healthy endothelium looks like. On the right is a gentleman that has a more sedentary lifestyle. Maybe he's not making such great food choices, blood sticking together. And as you can see on the top of the prescription bottles is a layer of what Dr. Sears calls sticky stuff. And I think in medical terms, it's plaque. Nitric oxide helps to lower the highs, such as high blood pressure and high cholesterol. It helps to raise the lows and acts as an antidepressant, a pain reliever, anti-inflammatory medication, and helps to regulate blood clotting and blood flow. So as Dr. Connor was talking about, inflammation can cause all of these diseases, such as Alzheimer's, heart disease and stroke, digestion issues, gut problems, and Dr. Sears calls them all itises, cancer, arthritis, and diabetes. And as you can see here, this man's body is on fire. Inflammation is when the body's immune system is on fire. And we, we either experience the pain as in painful joints, heart disease, and uh, gut pain, stomach aches. What is the largest contributor? I feel kind of like this is a repeat of what Dr. Connor shared. Um, the sticky stuff, the poor diet is a main contributor for inflammation. Dr. Sears calls this an IBOD and it's an inflamed body. And since Dr. Connor was talking about poor memory, I mean, uh, diabetes, I mean, dementia and diet, these are some of the results of a poor diet. And as you can see here, poor memory, dental cavities, stroke, poor vision, and the brain and the eyes are connected. And if the brain isn't getting the nutrition it needs, neither are the eyes. So a result is, one of the results is poor vision. And you can see all of these other health issues, diabetes, cancer, heart disease. It's just, the list goes on. So how can we reduce inflammation in the body? All we need to do is eat real food closest to mother nature. Foods that don't contain chemicals because Dr. Connor also talked about, you know, staying away from chemicals. So eating organic whenever you can, staying away from foods that are loaded with pesticides, herbicides, GMOs, and um, food that is grown closest to its natural state on a farm and, or swimming in the ocean. Dr. Sears developed a plan, a program called Traffic Light Eating. It's a simple and effective way for people to um, choose to eat more high quality foods. Red light is for eating as much as you want. It's very important for healing in the body. Yellow light foods, these are still important foods to eat, part of our di daily diet, and to eat in moderation. And red light foods, stop and think and make better choices if you can and only eat once in a while. Delving a little more into green light foods, they are anti-aging. We talked about eating more unprocessed foods. They are more naturally in color and abundance. I always say, eat the rainbow if you can. So when you make a salad, put as many colors in there as you possibly can. These foods can normally be eaten raw, but also cooked. These are lower in calories and nutrient dense, and you can eat as much as you want of these. Yellow light foods are also anti-aging. They are a necessary part of the healthy diet, and they provide different vitamins and minerals than green light foods do. 
They contain more sugar and um, fat than green light foods do. And Dr. Sears calls these type of foods or right carbohydrates, where you eat whole grain bread and pasta and yogurt, nuts, low-fat cheese, and lean meats and fish. Red light foods will age us. They are high in man-made fat. They are low in protein and fiber. They are highly processed, and they contain such ingredients as high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oils, artificial flavors and colors, and chemical preservatives. Dr. Sears calls these excitotoxins and also artificial sweeteners are in that category as well. These contribute to inflammation and unhealthy aging. They are included in packaged foods and fast foods. What types of foods should we be eating? Dr. Sears calls these the four S's. Smoothies and salads are a great way to add antioxidants, which are found in fruits and vegetables, rich in color. These will help reduce the sticky stuff that we were talking about that causes inflammation and disease. Nine to 14 servings. You might wonder why so much, but that's because our food system, our food is depleted. A, a head of lettuce or a bag of spinach does not have the same nutrition that it did 10 or 20 years ago. Spices are another um, ingredient that we can add to our food to help reduce inflammation. And seafood, especially salmon, contains omega-3s, which help to reduce inflammation in the body. And this helps improve endothelia function, which also helps increase the nitric oxide in the body. Dr. Sears suggests give yourself an oil change. <laughs> and Dr. Connor talked about these fats too. These come, these come from their natural sources. Omega-3s from salmon, olive oil, walnuts, and I love how the walnut looks like the brain, and avocado oils, and stay away from more man-made fats and um, some of these fried foods. Now, most of you will agree that Dr. Connor is this type of doctor. She had, has wonderful relationships with her patients, and this is truly important to have an excellent relationship with your doctor or your physician. It is a win-win. When you go into the doctor's office with the mindset of, doctor, what can I do? Instead of, you know, what kind of medication can I take to cure this disease? And sometimes there are diseases where we cannot, we have to recommend um, medication. Where the doctor also has the mindset, what can I advise instead of what can I prescribe? And one of the things that a doctor will prescribe is exercise. Exercise is an, a super way to help with disease prevention. And our waist size, as Dr. Connor talked about, is a true indicator of our overall health. And although, you know, it is um, common for us to gain weight over time and as we age, that is completely normal. And the difference between movers and sitters, as you can see, will help reduce the risk of getting Alzheimer's and you'll have improved vision, gum health, healthier glowing skin, stronger, healthier heart, better gut health, as Dr. Connor talked about, and joint health. And if you think of movement as your daily medicine, it's much easier to do. So, the way to do this is to develop an exercise routine. And with gyms being closed, one great way is to start your own home gym, buy some dumbbells and start moving, strengthening, um, strength conditioning, such as weightlifting, just purchase yourself some dumbbells and um, it helps to reduce the belly fat and helps to strengthen our bones and muscles. The second component is endurance exercise. This is great for the brain and also for the heart. Walking fast fits in here too, as long as you, know, you do it safely. Running, swimming, or cycling. Yoga and Pilates are a wonderful addition to this little routine here because flexibility is something that we lose as we get older and balance as well. 
So this is also great for preventing pain, arthritis pain. So remember, exercise is the primary way to increase nitric oxide into your body. Make sure you develop a fitness routine you enjoy and make sure that it's an exercise that you'll enjoy and do that you'll also do. Make time each day. I like to put it in my uh, planner every day. And 20 minutes a day can be a walk around the block, six days a week, keep it interesting and fun, I say. <laughs> and uh, isometrics are something that you can do anytime, anywhere, on a plane, in the car, watching a movie. Of course, check with your doctor first, start low and go slow, and choose to move instead of sit. Keep it safe and make it fun. These are the things that we covered today, how our body makes its own medicine, how we can reduce inflammation, traffic light eating, partnering with your physician and implementing a moving plan. The choices we make today will affect our tomorrows. Investing in our health and having health be our hobby is a great way to have a healthier, happier life. Thank you. Well, thank you both. That was super interesting and informative. Um, there are lots of questions in the chat, so I'll just start reading them. And um, if that works for you, uh, we'll, we'll go from there. I also got a few um, that came to me directly too, so I'll make sure to include those. If anybody else has a question, you can either raise your hand or you can put your question in the chat and we'll, we'll call on you. Um, the first question, uh, can you comment on the study using Donanab as reported March 13th in the New England Journal of Medicine? Donazumab? Maybe. It says Donanab, but <laughs> it's the very I think first it's question. A new, I, I think I heard about it too, Donanumab. I think what it is, yeah, I, I think I read about it too. Um, if I am right, I'm not certain. It is a monoclonal antibody that I think helps get rid of amyloid proteins. Um, don't know. We don't know how it's going to happen. We Right now, uh, we do know that none of the drugs, absolutely none of the drugs uh, out there um, that are given to people, that I gave to people, make really any difference in terms of uh, brain health. Uh, and in terms of decreasing Alzheimer's. It might slow it a bit, but this is a very interesting, I mean, my, my thought is who, let's not try to get amyloid and neurofibrillary tangles in the first place. Um, now, of course, there are people who are genetically more at increased risk of developing abnormal particles. They have actually a genetic mutation, um, but I don't think that that means they're definitely gonna get uh, uh, Alzheimer's. But it'll be interesting to see if this drug, and the problem with monoclonal antibodies, as, as you guys know, I mean, they can have so many side effects. So, you know, I would try to stick with everything you can to prevent diabetes and prevent Alzheimer's um, for your health. So uh, that will be remain to be seen. We'll see what this, um, what this drug does. Thank you. <clears throat> High blood glucose. Is glucose associated with how much or what kind of sweetener we consume? What does glucose mean here? Glucose is what is created in your body after the breakdown of all carbohydrates. And what happens is if you have diabetes, you are unable to process that glucose to get into cells. And so it sits in your bloodstream and you urinate it out. So I, I don't know if that was the answer to the question. Um, are all sugars the same? Uh, no, um, you know, all, but we do know that all the aspartames and all the uh, saccharins of the world have increased risk of all kinds of diseases. So I wouldn't use sugar substitute. The only one which I tend to say is probably okay is Truvia. Um, so that might be okay, but that's, uh, that's it. Try to, what happens is, is if you get used to eating all kinds of sugar substitute, you increase your desire for more sugar that way because you're getting used to a certain amount. And so you slowly want to try to wean down how much sugar you're eating. Thanks again. Does it matter whether the canola oil is non-GMO 
or is it the fact that it's a refined processed vegetable oil? Correct. The latter. Yep. Yeah. You want plants, you know, right from the coconut, um, <laughs> right from the olive. That's what you want. Can you reverse effects of a bad diet by adopting a good diet? Yes, absolutely. That's why our brain is neuroplastic. It's changing. We used to think it's, it didn't change, but we now know that it changes. So the answer is absolutely 100% yes. Are raw, fresh squeezed juices, for example, orange or carrot juices, a high glycemic food, no better than pasteurized juices? I don't believe in juices. I think they have too much sugar in it. They don't have the nutrients. I would stay away from juices. In general, especially for your diabetics out there, we tell people no juice. All right. What are our options in Humboldt County for rehabilitation and treatment of dementia? And then also from the same person, what are the newest discoveries about the disease and how will this further treatment and rehab? Well, on the latter, um, I mentioned to you what we now think about um, Alzheimer's in terms of the tau and amyloid proteins. But again, tau and amyloid proteins are there already in your brain. And so I think we've gone backwards. I mean, we just, we discovered it because we did autopsies on people who had dementia and we said, oh, look, there's amyloid and tau. What, what probably is happening is there, there are changes within the brain um, due to all these things that we just discussed that change the amyloid, that change the tau. Uh, and so they decrease our ability to get rid of bad cells and then increase this whole inflammatory process. So I want you all to think about inflammation being the problem in and of itself and the worst problem to all aspects of your body. You know, that's the problem is the inflammation. And what was the first part of the question? Ooh, let me go back. What are our options in Humboldt County for rehabilitation and treatment of dementia? Well, unfortunately, we have no nothing for rehab for dementia. I mean, once people get a certain past a certain a certain part um, of the Alzheimer's process, it's really hard to, to rehab them back. We have one uh, Timber Ridge Alzheimer's ward, um, and that is it. They don't do any rehabilitation, as far as I know, at Granada and all those other places. They don't have the money, they don't have the staff that is educated enough. Um, whether they even do rehabilitation at Timber Ridge, I don't know. I think they just have more trained people to care for people. And then um, since many of us are in our 70s and 80s, at what point is it too late to intervene in reverse dementia progression, assuming it has already been initiated? My theory is it's never too late. I mean, yes, there gets to a point where you have so much amyloid and so much stickiness and so many changes of the brain, it's, it's harder to go back, um, you know, but uh, it's never too late to help. Well, that's good news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there are supplements promoted to help produce nitric oxide. Do they work? And what is the role in supplements? Although I think you might have, have spoken about this during the presentation. Well, you know, I, it's interesting. I was, I was just looking at Prevagen because that's advertised so much. Um, but uh, they're really, the, even the Food and Drug Administration is looking at some of these kind of false claims of these uh, drugs. So my answer to you is, don't use them. You don't need them. They're probably a waste of time. <clears throat> now, will things come out in the future? I don't know. And then a preference for coconut oil over vegetable oil is still a minority opinion. Um, I think you must have said that in the presentation. Um, is preference that for coconut oil over vegetable oil is still a minority opinion? No, true? I think it's it's pretty standard now that you okay. that the the healthy oils are your coconuts your avocado oil is your olive oils of the world. And then um, recently read an insert in my uh, sample estrogen insert that said there's a possibility of earlier onset of dementia. Is that, how likely is that in the relationship? You know, we don't, we don't know um, with estrogen actually. Um, I think that's a, a story to be told in the future. Um, we know that estrogen, um, helps the brain actually quite a bit, um, as does testosterone. Um, whether you get an excess for whatever reason, whether you're taking it, um, you're taking too much, uh, like estradiol or whatnot. But um, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider, I mean, 
it, it is, it's a debatable thing and it's probably changing, but we know that estrogen can increase your risk of heart disease. So maybe it potentially can then increase your risk of Alzheimer's. Um, but I don't think that has been studied in terms of looking, doing a randomized controlled trial with everybody who's taking estrogen versus people who are never taking it. Um, I've never seen that study. Uh, maybe some other physician has. Right. Can you address the pros and cons of low fat dairy products versus whole fat dairy foods? I think when, when it comes to that, I think you have to look at the type of fat, okay? Um, you know, the, our concept of what used to be bad in our diet has dramatically changed. We used to think, you know, let's do everything low fat. And so then the, you know, the food industry went, okay, we'll do low fat, but we're going to now use more sugar. And unfortunately that has only increased our risk of diabetes. We need fat for our brain. Are the the linings of the of the neurons um, uh, are actually fat based, and so I don't think things are so bad fat. Now, if you want to do your own study and you know see do a low fat diet and see if it changes your cholesterol profile, you can. The problem is, even just the general cholesterol profiles don't give you a lot of good information. You need more of the what we call the lipo profile, uh, where it breaks down. Um, your uh, HDL and LDL into their various parts. So, um, you know, anyway, that, that's where I would say about a low fat diet. I, I'm, I'm not a complete believer, but it depends on the type of fat. I mean, yeah, you wanna have low fat. You don't wanna have a fried, fried chicken and anything fried, which increases the fat. Yeah, that's bad for you, but that's bad for you in a different way. Are, by, um, excuse me, are bananas high in glycemic index, healthy or unhealthy? <laughs> it's funny that you ask that. It's, that's a, it's very debatable. I personally think that bananas are, are very good for us. Yes, it, it's high in carbohydrates, but it has so much fiber that it helps to release that sugar fairly uh, slowly. And then um, can you eat turmeric if on blood thinner? Um, I can't exactly answer that. I still think there's nothing wrong with adding some turmeric to your diet. We it's, those are not things, you know, the things that we think about in terms of like, if you're on Coumadin specifically and not the other blood thinners, uh, a lot of the green leafy vegetables, um, can change your level of, uh, Coumadin levels. So, um, you got to be careful with that. Now, turmeric, not that I know of. Got it. There's a question about the Humboldt Senior Resource Center having a day program for dementia care. And I believe they do. There you go. There you go. Both Eureka and Arcata. What, now what they do there, I don't know whether they're trying to keep uh, your brain active because we know the more, the more you read, the more you exercise. Actually, if you, if you wanna know the, the key, even more than food, we know from studies that exercise is the best thing you can do to stave off dementia exercise, move your body. I mean, that's in every medical literature uh, there is. There you go. Um, and then another question was what things are done to rehabilitate people with dementia? Yeah. I, you know, it depends how far off you are. Right. You know, I mean, obviously good exercise, like we talked about, good eating habits, um, you know, some mind games uh, do help. Although recently I read an article about you know, you know, just doing Sudoku is good, but crosswords really don't make a sense. So I don't think we know. I think there's, that is still, you know, we have to wait to see. Exercise, the number one. Mm -hmm. Heidi, the next question is for you, but I think we've already talked about it. Raw, fresh, squeezed fruit juices or vegetable juices, should they be avoided? You know, that is a good question. And I know people that, you know, when you juice, you separate the fiber from the sugar of the fruit or vegetables. And that will definitely spike your blood sugar. So I recommend putting some of that pulp back into your juice and drink it together with the fiber because then it gets more slowly absorbed by the body. Thank you. Um, regarding supplements, are there basic supplements like vitamin D, B vitamins, vitamin C, omega-3s that are recommendable? Is it is the stevia and trivia that is actually the basic preferred sugar substitute? 
Um, right now, there isn't a lot of uh, evidence that uh, Truvia um, is, is a problem for people. As far as supplements, uh, what we do know is that if somebody is beginning to have cognitive changes, uh, we check their B12 um, and all their B vitamin levels to make sure they're normal because you can actually have a kind of a pseudo dementia if you have low vitamin B12 levels. Um, vitamin D is not specifically uh, known to change your brain uh, in terms of looking like you have a dementia, but it's very important to get normal vitamin D levels. And again, I, I'm, I'm one of these people that uh, go outside, you know, try to do it that way. Right. Inflammation and arthritis. Can diet reverse the effects of arthritis or is arthritis more of a hereditary disease? It's both. Okay. So um, there are people who are more at risk for arthritis, but arthritis is also known as an, any, well, it also depends on what type of arthritis. So your rheumatoid arthritis is definitely an inflammatory disease where your body's attacking itself. Osteoarthritis is also inflammatory, but it, it is usually, um, you're not really attacking yourself. You just have a mild level of inflammation all the time. Um, and what, was there another question? Um, it just asked if the arthritis was more, uh, was it more hereditary? Like, can you reverse the effects of both, arthritis? Both are hereditary, but yeah. Um, yeah. And then what about monk fruit sweetener? I don't know about studies in terms of um, Alzheimer's dementia. I don't know. And then there's a comment, uh, why bother juicing? Just make a smoothie with the whole food. There you <laughs> so, go. Yeah. And then there are um, lots of comments and um, very, very nice um, compliments about both presentations today in the chat. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I think I read through all the questions that were in the chat. Is there anything that I missed? Dave, Ted, you have a question? You want to unmute yourself? Uh, um, hi, Ted. Hi. It's uh, very hard to uh, absorb all of this. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if that material is available in printed form. Kim, you want to? Um, we don't have it in printed form, although the recordings do have um, the transcript along the side. So you can watch recording and you'll see the transcript. So you can see, you can watch it a few times. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and it is recorded. Um, and the recording, it, there's a question in the chat. You can find the recording on the Ollie website. If you um, navigate to the brown bag um, presentations, there's a link that says to archives and that's where the recordings will be found. Typically two to three days after um, a presentation, we try and get that up there. There's a few more questions. Um, what about alcoholic beverages as an inflammatory agent? Um, we know, uh, first of all, that red wine is anti-inflammatory, but the problem is you wanna be careful about the amount of alcohol you have. No more than one drink, and if you're gonna have it, red is always pre preferable because of its anti-inflammatory property. Um, no more than one for women. Um, we, I mean, there is ample evidence that people who drink uh, quite a bit develop um, early, early Alzheimer's type uh, disease in the brain. I mean, I would see that all the time. So you want to be limiting your alcoholic intake. I, 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 I found that I did um, miss one of the questions. Um, could you talk a bit about the Dr. Sears Institute? Is he still promoting soy? I'm going to leave that to Heidi. Yes. Um, I'm not sure about that. I'd like to look at that. Um, if he does, it, it would be organic soy but I don't know if he actually promotes it. He wrote a whole book about it. Oh, did he? Okay, yeah. I just have, <laughs> I have it. <laughs> okay, I just have, you know, I've been learning from, in the fall I learned from Primetime Health and we learned about um, making healthier hobby, which I can also do in group sessions, removing waste from your waist, um, making your own medicine, which goes in more into detail about uh, nitric oxide and living without pain and inflammation. These are like, uh, six week course that can be done on Zoom or it can be done one on one on Zoom right now with COVID. So learning more in detail. I mean that the presentation I did was just a real um, short little sneak peek at what 
there's there's more to this. So yes. Right. Just touching on what's out there. I have not read all his books. There are 45. I bet Dr. Connor has so. though. <laughs> no, I have not. No. Oh, God. He's a very intelligent man. He's um he is actually what convinced me uh, to end up going on Juice Plus many years ago, but um, he also believes uh, in his books on child rearing were the best. So I give that as a present. It's called the baby <laughs> book. I give it a present anytime anybody has a child. Oh, there was funny. a question in here by Deborah Strom. Are cereals made with whole grains? Oh, okay. She sent that. I think she sent that to me. Um, the answer with cereals is to, it depends on how processed they are. Um, and again, anything that's processed really would be better to avoid them. Um, now, if they're processed with good, like pea protein um, and all the omegas and flaxseed and all that, you know, you're just weighing how high your sugar might go if you eat a fair amount of that carb all at once uh, versus what's in it. So, um, uh, the one cereal that I like and I tell people to have is, is steel cut oats. Those are excellent ways of um, getting a whole bunch of fiber um, and oats in general can be very, but the problem is like things like oats in granola have a ton of sugar and that's not good for you. Mm -hmm. So, but steel cut oats are excellent source of, of uh, fiber. If I can say, if there's a, a balance of protein, fiber, and um, less sugar. Mm -hmm. So the lower the sugar in the cereal, the better. Right, absolutely. I also wanted to add that um, we do have a couple of other classes coming up. Um, Dr. Connor is teaching a class on um, an update on immunizations and also understanding migraine headaches coming up in the next couple of weeks. And we also do have a pre-diabetes class with Carlisle Douglas that's coming up in a, in a week or so too. So those are all three, you know, all three of those are really great classes to continue this conversation. Please and I can, asked if you can reverse autoimmune arthritis if it's already set in. Uh, every single autoimmune disease can be improved uh, by eating well, exercise, all of that, because it's all decreasing your inflammatory response. But if you actually have the, <laughs> the arthritis, the, the accumulation of calcium in the joint. Right, well, it's very, it, is, it is very hard to reverse those changes once the joint not only changes. I mean, your, your point is excellent. What is the whole reason that we're now giving monoclonal antibodies to people with rheumatoid arthritis is to prevent those deposits that end up in the joint that change the way the joint moves. Um, so we want to start on those early as possible, but you also want to start early as possible, everything anti-inflammatory. But, that makes sense, but is the only resolution then to go in and clean out the, the extra calcium whether it's in your knees, your hips, or your back. There's no way to get rid of that, no. Right, other than, yeah, potentially having surgery. Yeah. There's another question. Um, what about eggs, yay or nay? It's debated, but, um, you know, again, uh, eggs have lots of, you know, lots of good protein in them. Um, that whole concept of not having the egg yolk, I think, is going down the drain where we recommend eggs. Um, Again, this whole, this, I mean, when I went to medical school, it was a low fat diet. Don't eat eggs. You're going to get high cholesterol. I mean, the things that we thought back then are just not true anymore. So yeah, I think you can eat your eggs. All right. Any other questions? I, I there think I, um, Mandy? Yeah. I'm Mandy. I had um, a small bowel back bacterial overgrowth earlier in life. I've had stomach problems forever. And I'm just wondering what the, what is the, after the small bowel bacterial overgrowth, I went with only lemons, limes, and cranberries for the longest time. When my dad died, I had to start taking care of my mom who has Alzheimer's and my diet has gone up and down and you know and i'm trying to get back down to what's the right 
level of sugar for your body to like I'm allowing bananas and blueberries again and uh, I have had breast cancer I'm scared of food I want to be okay is there a what's the the goal in my mind as far as how much how many grams of sugar per day you know i'm not going to get into that here mandy those are fruits, but things that you could what's, talk what's the right amount to be trying to avoid sugar how how much sugar does my brain need to be able to function as energy your brain you is going to get that? sugar from your brain is going to get sugar from all kinds of things that you eat. A plant-based diet is probably the best thing that you can do for your body. Um, and you can get lots of proteins uh, from plants. you certainly okay. can get sugar. Um, the whole small bile okay. overgrowth is a, is a very complicated topic that involves gut microbiome. Um, and at one point I can give a, a talk on all of that, uh, but that's kind of going away. But we also know that um, when your gut microbiome is not working properly, that that increases your risk of Alzheimer's as well. But that gets a little bit too much, I think, for this discussion here today. Right, right. And what about, um, what about taking MCT oil? I don't know. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. That's a refined version of, of coconut oil, basically. Okay, yeah, I don't, I, it's not something that I have done or recommended before. I, you know, I, I recommend using it in, in cooking. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I, Go ahead, Hyde. Oh, I just wanted to say that um, Dr. Sears does recommend L-arginine, which is an amino acid that the, that healthy adults can take. And um, he even has a dose on here, but I think that that would be something that people would talk to with their physicians, with their doctors, of course, and L-citrulline. So those are two, that was answering a question about supplements. But mainly nose breathing, meditation, laughter, mm -hmm. exercise, you know, those are the kind social of- Social interaction. Social interaction, right? Good relationships <laughs> are huge. Yes. Well, we do our best to keep you all connected here um, through Ollie, and we appreciate you all being here today. Um, I don't see any other questions, so I just, again, would like to thank our presenters. So I'm going to give a little applause. Thank you. <laughs>